Okay, so today I'm going to talk about how do we handle integrations at Log Planner. And first of all, I'm starting with who am I? So um, I'm backend developer in integrations team at Log Planner. And I joined Log Planner in 2011, moved to Poland in 2014. So you can ask me some questions like, so far, how was it? How was your experience in Poland? It's been three years, right? So, and it's cool. What kind of perfect? And I used to be a .NET developer, and now I'm doing PHP since last three years. And last but not least, it's my birthday today. So. Good, so maybe we can sing Stolat song later. Not now, um, but it's okay. I know a little bit, Stolat and Stolat. Cool, okay, so, but now let's proceed to who are we as dog planner? So we as dog planner help people um, book visits and find doctors online. And we are also trying to help doctors like by giving handy solutions to them and that helps their work. So, and we also have one aim, and that is making the healthcare experience more human. That's, uh, that's been our goal since last year. And before that, we uh, more focused on the part of finding a doctor and booking a, an appointment online. Some facts about uh, our company. So far, um, we have raised $50 million. It's a little bit higher than this, but it's better to approximate. And we are leading the market in eight countries. Some hot countries like Spain, Italy, Mexico, Brazil, you know, nice ones. And also we are operating in 19 countries worldwide. Plus we booked some 400,000 visits, 20 million patients visit our system. Out of all doctors, 27,000 of them use uh, our software to make their work easier. Few more facts. Um, we have integrations from five countries in three different continents. Asia, Europe, plus Latin America. Also, we have 40 people on board on, in IT. We have terabytes of data uh, that is in use in production. We have 2.5 million requests daily. And uh, excluding the static and those requests, like file requests. And we have 10,000 lines addition every week. The last time I counted, it was 10,200 something, but it's okay. And we are logging nearly uh, 10,000 gigabytes of logs daily. So, um, is there anybody who haven't used Doc Planner so far? Okay, I see some. Okay, let's integrate them. First, um, I will demonstrate you how we work, so how people use our system. So first thing is people get sick. And then they feel like shit. So maybe not as happy as him because it's kind of happy and he accepted himself as being shit, but that's okay. So and then people do, do some stuff to get better, like drinking water. Well, it helps and it doesn't help from time to time. So, but I say, nope. So, it's also cool. We want them to book visit on Zranlekaj. And most of the time, they do. So, I have, they don't demonstrate all this stuff, but where are the integrations and how do they affect our system? So, first things first. Integrations are synchronization of calendars. Our calendars with the facilities calendars. And synchronization not just uh, includes showing the same free slots on both of the systems, but also synchronization of bookings. If someone books a visit on our system, we also book it on facility system. So we will have full uh, integration on both sides. To achieve this, we have three types of integrations. One is traditional integration, V, as dog planner, implement the third party systems into our software. Second one is integration API, which is the partner takes our API and implements it into their system. 
And the third one is, which is quite extraordinary and uh, interesting, because it contains traditional integrations and integration API. So um, it takes traditional integrations and communicates through traditional integrations and also communicates with integration API through our monolith. Integration application is self-contained application that is um, kind of microservice. I'm actually, um, whoa, it's too bright. <laughs> anyway, I'm cool. Not as cool as that, but okay. So um, integration application is kind of microservice, but I'm kind of uh, trying to avoid this micro part because it's actually not micro. We have shit load of integrations and it makes it huge to manage and to monitor everything is contained in this self-contained application. So let's start with traditional integrations. Traditional integrations, um, as I said, we implement third party software into our system. And there are some advantages and disadvantages. It starts bringing money real fast because it's possible to implement in just one day. Like in one day you can say, hey, your integration is ready so patients can book a visit and you can see it in your facility software. Cool. Also, when entering a new market, it's also cool because when you are entering a new market, you are not actually strong. So you are going to these software providers and you can't just tell them, hey, I want you to integrate your system with mine. They will probably just look at you and say, bitch, please, no. So it doesn't work that way. So that's why it's better for you to go and ask, hey, do you have some kind of web service that I can just uh, make my system talk to? And they, they will probably say, of course, just take it, here it is. And disadvantages, for example, one is every implementation <coughs> differs. There is no like standard PSR or something for hospital integration. There is no some web standard or something. It can be SOAP, REST. It can be REST contained in SOAP or maybe something different. Uh, people do crazy things. And you never know when it can go down. This is very important because Sometimes we face with some really weird situations, like they might not pay their electricity bills. They might not, um, somehow, someone can plug the, uh, unplug the plug and then it can, internet can go down and this kind of stuff. So it can go down any minute, so you have to have it in your mind. And it requires lots of resources on servers. So let's take a look at uh, how we can actually create one traditional integration. It will be some simple um, waypoint. One, someone comes to you and tells you, hey, um, I have this integration. So, okay, what type of integration? Which software they, do they use? Software X. So, did we implement this software before? No. So, we have to implement it first. And when we implement it, then we can just register this web service or integration into our uh, database, and then we can just enable it. To enable it, we are attaching hospitals to this integration, so it will know which facilities, calendars, that it should update. And then we are setting up workers that will handle updates of doctor list and synchronization of calendars. That's all. But still, requires some manual stuff. For example, implementing software client that uh, will never be um, gone because someone has to implement software and that's developer's job. Second thing is attaching uh, hospitals and registering and third one is developer's job to set up workers. You have to set up workers then you have to just commit it and you have to deploy it because these workers should start and if it doesn't start the integration doesn't work. Let's take a look at anatomy of traditional integrations. So. On the top, you see users. Uh, users are making requests, getting responses, as usual. And in the middle, we have these application servers from our monolith. And then, um, when a user tries to book a visit, this happens. We get this uh, booking, we do everything it on our site, and then we just send this to the hospital web service. And then, um, hospital web service can say either yes or no. Pretty simple. And then when they say yes, we just take it 
we say, okay, we connect it with the visit on our system. So um, let's say the visit with ID X on hospital is connected to the visit with ID Y on our system. So we connect it. And then we say to user, hey, we booked your visit. Here it is, here's the confirmation. So sometime later they can cancel it, but also hospital can also cancel this visit because they have also uh, some possibility to send requests to us, such as uh, on the left bottom side, you can see remove slot and cancel visit. They can cancel visit, just like saying, hey, uh, you remember you booked a visit on my side, and now I want you to cancel it on your side because I canceled it. So, and then you say, sure, mate, I canceled it. And they can also remove slots from our calendar. So they can say, hey, um, this slot is not valid anymore, so you have to invalidate it on your side. You say, cool. Okay, and on the bottom, right bottom, <coughs> you see two workers. And these workers are responsible for updating doctor list and synchronization of calendars. So they are co continuously running and updating all these resources on our site. So we will provide our users the latest data every time. So let's say, take a look at integration API, which is my favorite, because we don't do much. So integration API, um, I like it too much because it has very low maintenance. To be honest, I don't even remember when was the last time I made some change uh, or when it go, when, went down. Uh, it's covered with full tests and all, so it's pretty cool. And the second thing is single place to maintain. We have one API, which is integration, and this integration API has just one point. It's like you can consider it as a bundle and this bundle has just one place. And then we only maintain this, and it's pretty easy to look at it and fix if something goes wrong. It's easy on resources. There are no huge payloads. We get requests, we answer it, and then we trigger what needs to be triggered, and then it works. And we know what's failing when. This is very important because uh, when you have such APIs that uh, people are using heavily, you have to monitor and you have to be able to say, um, you sent some request, you got some error, uh, you got some error because you sent this. Or it can be something like you sent uh, the date time format in a wrong way, you sent uh, X instead of Y, so that's why it failed. Because we face with these problems every day. They say, some clients, um, this request doesn't work because um, you didn't do this. So you have to know what you are dealing with and how you are dealing with. And the most important thing for me here is integration API <coughs> integrations are working even if the third party is down. So if they fail, if their server is down, if their um, computer doesn't work, if something happens, if their hard disk failure happens, it doesn't matter, it works. And, but there are some consequences also, like when we have this integration type, it takes too much time for third parties to implement this integration. It can take mm, two weeks, at least, at least. It can take six months for some providers. Because it's not about just implementing the system. And if this software house or software provider is big, they will plan this uh, implementation. They will develop it. They will, after development, they will test it. After testing, they will just release this update to, the, to their software. And after this releasing, every hospital that are our client has to apply this update to their system. It's a pretty long way. So that's why it's a disadvantage. Another thing is, we don't have control over how this API is consumed. So we provide our clients documentation, but we can't tell them to use it like how we want them to use. Because it's kind of complicated for them because they have some kind of structure already and maybe their data structure is not compatible with ours so they are doing it in the most um, acceptable way <coughs> as they see. So, we provide few functionalities through Integrations API and you can look at its uh, documentation in the bottom of the uh, slide I wrote it. I hope you can see it. And we are providing calendar management, booking management, and everything uh, except these two 
are made because we wanted to make these two, calendar management and booking management, uh, possible. Everything else, editing certain elements of doctors and notification system is built to make this calendar management and booking management more efficient. For example, if we are to take a look at notification mechanism, it's just like this. So on the top left, you can see uh, our integration API. And in the top right, you see our consumer. So if a consumer wants to get a notification through our system, uh, there are two stacks for each integration. They can choose either one of them. So let's say the consumer chose this full stack. And then when something happens, like booking and some slot changed, or booking mode, booking cancel, these kind of notifications are stacked up in this pull or push notification stacks. So if a consumer wants to pull a notification, it goes through our API, it makes a request, and then we our API, they choose this notification through our notification stack and then serves it to our client. It's pretty simple. Pool is really simple because it only is being served when the client asks for it. But in push case, um, our worker continuously pushes the notifications that are arrived in this push stack. So uh, when a push notification happens, we try to push it to the consumer's endpoint, wherever they want to. And then we say, hey, uh, did you get it? And they have to reply with some code, like 2xx200 codes. And uh, except these 200 codes, everything else is considered to be failed. It can be 400, 500, doesn't matter. We consider everything else as failed. And we try to send it three times. And if we can't, uh, get a proper response after all these tries, we say, okay, let's leave it. And then we just put it somewhere that, uh, that will only be uh, taken back to the queue under some supervision. And then we say, hey, uh, we tried to send notifications to your endpoint, but it doesn't work. So can you just please take a look at it? And then at the same time, our system continues to stack up these notifications, bookings, movings, cancellations, uh, slot chains, everything. So when, let's say, the third party uh, takes this uh, endpoint live again, we send these notifications to them so they keep their system up to date. But sometimes it's not really enough because clients and software providers they may want some extra controls, extra powers, and we can provide them. So, for example, uh, most asked thing, let's say, is before finalizing a booking, they want to check if the slot is still available. So let's say they are sending this, uh, updating their calendars in our system every 15 minutes, let's say. And if they don't do it, they want to be sure that when, uh, when someone wants to book a visit, in this 15 minutes interval, is it still valid or not? So they want to check it right before finalizing the booking. Second thing is, they can actually uh, disable some functionalities and disallow some certain bookings. For example, um, if a visit is in some kind of certain time range, let's say from now to 12 hours further, in this rate, if it's in that range, they can just disallow this kind of movings. It can say, if this visit is too close to be moved. Or they can disable some function entirely. But, as I say, it's a power, and power comes with responsibility. <clears throat> what it means? It's kind of simple. We will give them this power, but imagine what I said in this notification system. Notification system designed to work even if the third party goes down. But if I give them this power of checking a booking before it's finalized, if the third party goes down, whole notification system loses its ability of uh, surviving without this third party. So it's becoming dependent on the third party. So that's where it becomes a problem. Let's take a look at it's this real-time notification flow. So a user makes a booking request. 
our system sends it to the third party, we get yes. That's OK. Perfect. That's what I want. And now, we send this confirmation to the user. Everyone is happy. Booking is booked. Everything is perfect. So in case of no, OK, you said no. Hospital said no. We say, hey, um, dear patient, we couldn't book this visit because of a reason. Or you can just try another slot. Cool. But what happens in terms of a third party failure? In this case, there is nothing else we can do but to show a try again message. So I can also show it again if you are taking a photo or something. Cool. OK. So, and at this point, we saw traditional integrations, its advantages, disadvantages, API integrations, its advantages and disadvantages. And now we are moving on to integration set. Integration set, as I said in the beginning, it's mixture, like combination of traditional integrations and API integration. So first, it's a self-contained application. And it's managing, managing these traditional integrations through API. It's translating the messages of third parties into a message that monolith wants and desires and can handle easily. And it automatic, automatically uh, scales itself so for example, if there is a huge message queue line, then it scales itself. It looks at the CPU and the other factors. And then it says, oh, I'm struggling with these old messages, so I have to scale up. And it does. And it's more autonomous than traditional integration. Because as I uh, showed you in the previous slides, uh, creating a traditional integration was quite painful. It required lots of manual stuff. So, at this point, we try to make it more autonomous and we achieve this goal. And the last thing is, integration set, like most of the um, microservices, it can communicate through API. So what we want to achieve here is, Monolith can continue to talk to their uh, traditional integrations, cool. And integrations app also can continue to uh, manage the traditional integrations at this point. And integrations that will talk to Monolith on behalf of all those uh, traditional integrations. So in this case, integrations app has to manage small and big integrations. And small integrations like um, are 75% of all integrations we have. And, but large integrations, which is 25, percent are consuming more resources than all of the other percent. So it's a huge difference. <clears throat> and for small integration, it takes less than a minute to update resources. But for large integration, it can take up to two hours. And exceptional cases, it's three hours. So in this case, when we want to update resources of an integration, we have to decide between workers and periodically producing a task. So workers, they don't rely on message queue because they are actually both producer and consumer inside itself. So it's producing, but consuming the message in a way of synchronous way. So it's producing and consuming right inside, of, inside itself. It has to be set up manually by some developer, like it's same as adding a supervisor entry, it's same as setting up a cron job. So however you want to uh, manage your processes. Periodically producing a task relies on message queue like RabbitMQ or Kafka or others. And tasks are handled by consumers, so there are no extra processes that you have to set up or there are no extra supervisor entries or new cron jobs, so it just works. And it's asynchronously handling tasks. So you just say, hey, uh, I produced this message, so can you handle it? And some consumer <clears throat> in our application is taking it out, producing it, handling it, and then says, done. Next message, please. And it doesn't require deploy, because as I said, in workers, you have to add some configuration. You have to deploy it, because the instance, uh, the clusters must be renewed. 
In this case, in this periodically producing a task, it doesn't need to be deployed again because it happens. You just produce a message and the message type still same. And consumer, uh, the only common thing between them is kind of they all need kind of some process manager because if a consumer or produ producer uh, process is dies, it has to just run again. And supervisor actually takes care of it instead of uh, on behalf of us. So this is the most basic explanation of uh, how we can produce some task and consume. So there are these juice, update doctors, sync calendar, and producer produces a message puts it into the queue, and consumer takes it out and manages this task and handles it. But the important thing is when to produce a task. Because, OK, there are workers. I have a list of workers that needs to run in some kind of frequency, like, let's say, every 60 seconds, every 5 minutes, every 15 minutes. So when do we decide uh, how to produce this task? So this is the algorithm behind it, like the most simple way to explain it. First, we are checking the last execution time. And if it's too early to execute it, we say, OK, so there's no need to produce this message. We can just try to produce another message. And if, it's, if we are too late to execute this task, then we say, OK, so um, are there any processes that are running this task? And in this part, I chose to uh, use this locked term because at this point, we are using semaphore concept and we are using uh, locking algorithm through Redis. So we are checking if there is a process that is trying to handle this task. We are not producing it because it's already being handled. And if no one is handling this task, then we say it's safe to produce this task. Let's move on. And the next question is, when a consumer should handle a task? So a consumer should handle a task when, again, we check this last execution time, if it's too late or if it's too early. <clears throat> and if it's task locked or some other consumer is trying to uh, handle it or not. And if, they are, if there is no one handling this task, we lock this task so no one will try to uh, handle this task other than us. And then we handle it. After we just finish with this task, we say, OK, it's safe. Unlock it. And then after this step, we just notify our monitoring tool about this uh, completion of this task. So we can see, we can monitor, monitor the tasks, how they are working, if they are not working, if they are working. So um, there are some few flows, as I told you. Integrations app is a combination of uh, API and traditional integration. So it also consists of real-time booking notifications and real-time notifications. So if I want to book a visit, it looks like this. This is a happy flow, like happy fair, completely happy. User makes a booking request, and Doc Planner, our system, our monolith, sends this booking provision to our integration set. We get this booking. And we are checking if this slot is still exists on third party. And if third party says it is available, then we say, OK, uh, Monolith, you can process the booking. At this point, <coughs> there are two things happening. One, we give confirmation to the user, hey, your visit is booked. At the same time, our Monolith sends integrations add a notification. Hey, this uh, booking is the finalized version. You can take it. You, can, you have everything you need. And now we are trying to book this finalized booking on third party. At this point, third party books this visit on their system, and we register it on our site. So failed booking flow. So again, user makes a request. We get notification. We check it if this is available. If it's available, yes. We confirm it. User gets confirmation. We get some finalized booking notification. We try to book it on third party, but here's something interesting. What if third party denies to book this visit? At this point, 
it's failing. And now it's canceling on our monolith because we tried to book this visit three times on third party. And if we can't do it, then if, I, if we keep this visit on our monolith, then it will create some kind of inconsistency. Most likely, the worst case scenario might happen here if we don't cancel visit is patient goes to the hospital, there is no such visit, and then they will yell at us, hey, I booked a visit and I couldn't find it, so I have to wait for, let's say, two hours to get a new visit. So we cancel it and we notify the patient about this cancellation. So what about this non-existing slot? A failure again. A user books a visit, we send this booking provision. We are checking if the slot is available. It's not. So we say, hey, it's rejected. And user says, okay, so I might need to try another slot. So that's uh, the last step of all integration. In this integration step, it's actually another layer, but it's the easiest way to manage all those uh, traditional integrations. So, to recap, we are integrating for the greater good. We are not saying um, traditional integration is bad because we have to implement into our software and it, uh, it requires more maintenance. But we have to integrate it because it gives you some pace when you are entering a new market. And second thing is um, your stronger side. If you are good with this, let's say, traditional integration in a country, okay. Let's go with this. And since we have this application that makes it fully autonomous, which we have with this periodically producing messages, we can choose this way. And we have to observe our partners because they can send some payloads in the way that you have never guessed or never imagined. So you have to take a look at those payloads and understand the, your partner, how they are using it, and improve your system according to your, uh, according to your partners. And you always have to keep an one eye open because if your system is uh, the origin of these integrations, if a user tries to book a visit and if they can't, your system is showing try again message. And for them, in their eyes, the failure is yours. No one else's. So that's all. Questions? Cool, I made a great job. Thank you so much. <laughs>